Then a few things on LoRaWAN security. First, the physical layer, LoRa, does not provide any security. So uh, even though you can use LoRa, LoRa chips and LoRa concentrators to communicate over long range, you get all the benefits, um, it doesn't provide any security mechanism. It only contains a checksum, a CRC, um, if there haven't been any symbols flipped, any bits flipped. Um, um, but any other mechanisms are not provided by the physical layer. For that, you really need LoRaWAN. And LoRaWAN provides security on the three pillars of security. So the authenticity, the integrity, and the confidentiality. So authenticity means that you know with which device you are communicating. It's authenticated. Integrity means that the data that is being sent and received is not tampered with. So you know for sure who sent the message, but also that the message uh, hasn't, hasn't changed by an intermediate party. And finally, the confidentiality means that um, you can encrypt the data so that uh, on the application layer, for example, the data is encrypted uh, and that the network cannot see what the payload is. So how does that work? Uh, LoRaWAN provides security on two different layers. Uh, first, the network layer, um, and that is uh, security is provided by the network uh, session key. And uh, second is the application layer and the uh, security there is provided by the application session key. Uh, so the network S key, session key, and the app S key, the uh, application session key. The network session key is used for uh, integrity uh, and authenticity, whereas the application session key is used for confidentiality. These are uh, AES 128-bit uh, keys, and uh, that is an in industrial standard uh, for securing communications and at the same time it's still relatively cheap for end devices to implement uh, AES 128-bit. So then there is a LoRaWAN session and a session, a network session, is um, a session actually comes in in two sessions that the end device has, one with the network and one with the application. So that also is the network session key and the application session key. There are, there are in fact, two sessions. Um, the network session um, contains a device address that's a, a four-byte address that's issued by the network server. Um, there is a network session key and there are uh, frame counters uh, and there is some MAC state, so the media access control state. Uh, so the frequencies that are being used, the delays, the data rates, things like that, everything that the LoRaWAN network server manages. The application session um, is, is secured by the application session key, also has frame counters. Um, and during a session, the session keys don't change and the frame counters are incremented uh, and the state can be changed, um, but the device can uh, reset the session. And that's the difference between the two activation modes. So a session can be um, established dynamically by joining a network, and that's called over-the-air activation, or OTAA. And this uh, involves a joint procedure. So the device, when it is not on a network yet, it sends a joint request, uh, basically requesting to join on a network. And um, the network server, any network server can respond uh, to that device to allow the device to join that network. And that requires the network uh, to perform some cryptographic operations uh, and that, um, uh, that the device is also allowed uh, to join that network. And uh, every time the device joins a network, there is a new set of security keys generated. So there is a new uh, network session key and a new application session key. The alternative is a hard-coded session. So that's called ABP, activation by personalization. And uh, then there is no joint procedure. In fact, the end device gets hard-coded, pre-programmed, a device address um, and the session keys. And um, this is typically more efficient because you don't need to join procedure, uh, but obviously it's not as secure because uh, you cannot really change networks through, uh, throughout the lifetime of the end device. So which one is safer? 
it's it's highly recommended to use over the air activation um, because there is a new session every time the device joins um, instead of ABP it's always the same session um, over the air activation uh, also allows rekeying you can even with a newer LoRaWAN version you can even instruct and devices to join again um, and uh, whereas uh, if you have an ABP device these session keys they are stored somewhere in that end device and they will never change um, with over-the-air activation, you can also uh, join any LoRaWAN network and you can even uh, change from network to network. Uh, whereas in the case of ABP, you can also do that, but then you need to copy all these keys to different networks and you cannot require other networks to forget uh, those session keys. So it's a trade-off between security and resource constraints, but typically prefer over-the-air activation. Session keys, so I mentioned already uh, the application session key and the network session key. Those are uh, keys that are generated from a root key, in this case the app key. That's in LoRaWAN uh, 1.0.x, a uh, generation of LoRaWAN. In LoRaWAN 1.1, um, there are keys per purpose, and there are two root keys. So there is still the app key, and the app key is used to generate the application session key uh, with the sole purpose of encrypting and decrypting application payload. And then there is another root key, and that's a network key. And a network key is used uh, to generate uh, three different session keys that each have their own purpose. Uh, so it's uh, integrity checks for a forwarding and a serving network, it's in case if a device is covered by another network and there is a traffic exchange between two networks, you can have you can share the forwarding integrity key with that network. Um, I won't go into all the details now, um, but that's integrity check. And then second is the encryption key, and the network um, session encryption key is used to uh, encrypt uh, uh, instructions that are sent to the end device. Uh, for example, to change data rates or to change delays or to use a different frequency or things like that. Um, so that's the key derivation for the different session keys. So um, LoRaWAN security, end-to-end -end security is provided uh, by what you see here in red, uh, the uh, application uh, session key. In light blue is the um, security uh, contract between the end device and the network server, uh, which is um, uh, uh, enabled by the network session key. But then uh, a gateway is just any internet connected device. So it has an IP address, it has somewhere deployed, and you also want to have a secure connection with your gateway. Um, but you can use any industry standard for that. So you can use uh, TLS certificates to connect gateways um, or API keys or things like that, or IP security, or you can make them part of a VPN, um, uh, as long as they have a secure channel to communicate with uh, the network server. And the same goes, obviously, uh, from the network server to the application server. We typically use industry standards for that, TLS API keys, uh, TLS client certificates, things like that. A few things on privacy. So. Um, LoRaWAN is a, is a protocol and it uses a uh, uh, unlicensed spectrum. Anyone can set up a LoRa gateway and as, if you do so, then you start receiving LoRaWAN traffic. So even though the payload is encrypted, there is a bunch of metadata um, that is public and application developers, LoRaWAN developers need to be mindful of what those uh, what those fields are. So when a device joins the network, for example, it sends the, uh, the join EOI, uh, that's a pointer to the join server, which is a component that generates those session keys. It sends the dev UI, that's a unique uh, identifier of the end device, um, uh, and that just flies through the air, that's fine. And as soon as a device has a session established and it sends a message, there is a device address, uh, there are frame counters, there are ports that are being used, and the length of the payload, and the length of the frame. Um, so that's all public. Um, so there are some uh, recommendations on how to make sure that uh, eavesdroppers, even though they cannot read payload, they also cannot know what the payload 
could potentially mean or which device it is or who owns the device. Um, uh, so um, uh, that's, that, is, that is important to keep in mind. So when you provision end devices, um, uh, you need to program them with a uh, join UI and an app UI. And um, you want to uh, share the root key, so the app key and the network key, in a secure way. So if you are a device maker, you need to have a secure way to transport those root keys to somewhere uh, on the network. Uh, where uh, the owner of the device can activate these devices with. So um, what, you, what you don't want to do is to send these root keys uh, in an Excel file or by email or print it on paper uh, to the customer. Um, because then um, uh, if the device gets changed, of, uh, get a change of ownership or throughout the distribution chain, it's really hard to make sure that only the uh, rightful owner has ever seen uh, those root keys. So in LoRaWAN, there is a, there is a mechanism um, using a specification that's called the uh, LoRaWAN backend interfaces. And uh, there is a concept of a joint server. And that is a, a backend service that um, you can use to provision your root keys with. And the joint server decides which network is allowed to um, activate the device on. Uh, and there could be a very simple claiming procedure. So you, uh, you build your devices, you provision these root keys on a joint server. And then you, um, when you sell the device, you also provide a proof of ownership so that the owner can claim the device and can go on the joint server and say, hey, um, these are my devices. I want to use the Things network. I want to use my private network. I want to use uh, a public operated network. And then the joint server allows join requests from that network to activate your device. That's typically the recommended way. So that's a joint server. It's a dedicated server for handling the sensitive part of the activation procedure uh, on a LoRaWAN network. And uh, so what the joint server does, it, it authenticates a network server, an application server. It has a secure storage of root keys. And we typically see that joint servers have a uh, hardware secure module or an HSM uh, to securely store these root keys. Uh, and the joint server generates the session keys and gives them to the network server and the application server um, that are allowed to activate the device. So that's a recommended way of uh, securing LoRaWAN. A few other security features in LoRaWAN are um, commands to check uh, the link quality. And uh, that is, can be useful for devices to know and to uh, be sure that they are still um, on the network. And if they are not, for example, that they don't just keep on sending messages, but that they, for example, refer back to a joint procedure uh, to join a different network uh, so that they don't get lost. Um, there's also the ability to uh, um, acknowledge messages, so to get a confirmation from the network that a message has been received. This could be uplink and downlink. So the adaptive data rates that I mentioned before, that is actually also a security feature um, because it reduces the packet loss. And um, having a high packet loss can actually lead to uh, security vulnerabilities. Uh, LoRaWAN also comes with frame counters. Um, each message has its own frame counter within a session, and that avoids uh, replay attacks. So even though the message can get picked up by an intermediate, uh, it doesn't make sense to replay that message later, uh, because the network or the device uh, will figure out that it has already received that message. And finally, there are um, uh, numbers that are, can only be used once uh, for the security uh, of the of the joint procedure uh, when activating. So there's every joint procedure is unique uh, because of such nonce, a number used once. So for securing a few tips, um, don't share your root keys, use a joint server, uh, use a unique root key for each end device, so don't use the same root key. Uh, make sure also that the root key is not something that's generated from, uh, from a serial number or anything, uh, but it's really uh, generated by a random number generator. Um, 
also make sure that uh, you never reuse those nonces and frame counters. And that means that you need to have uh, persistent memory in the end device. And you also need to have a network server that is obviously also respecting these security features. When choosing over the air activation versus uh, activation by personalization, um, choose over the air activation unless you have a really good reason not to. Uh, and finally, um, yeah, make use of a trusted third party join server uh, that doesn't lock you in to a certain ecosystem, um, but it allows you to activate the device on any uh, LoRaWAN network, even your own.